Pastor Sonny gave me the topic. I don't think any preacher um, relishes preaching on this. It's a very necessary topic. But I think uh, anyone who would stand in this place would feel undeserving, unworthy. Uh, certainly been a time for me to pray, search me, O God, know my heart. Because Sonny asked me to preach on integrity. And it reminded me of what John Wesley said when he said, I'm going to preach holiness until I'm holy. And uh, so in the same way, in the places that I fall short, and I think all of us may have a few chinks in our armor, let's preach integrity until we are integrous. And I am believing the Lord for his grace uh, for all of us during this time. I want to give you, uh, Dickens wrote a book called Tale of Two Cities, which is a great book, by the way. I want to give you a tale of two men. One, his name is Richard Dorch. Uh, he went to heaven a few years ago. The other is Martin Luther. Richard Dorch was a highly respected man of God in the Assemblies of God. Not, I'm not saying anything uh, out of turn here. He himself has written on this subject. Uh, as a respected voice in that denomination, Jim Baker, back in the 80s, asked him uh, and was really leaning on the integrity of Richard Dorch and the reputation that he had, asked, uh, he asked Brother Dorch to be part of uh, PTL. Over time, Richard Dorch found himself uh, having to make excuses for some things that he saw and then uh, literally lying about things that were going on at that time at PTL. Uh, ultimately, Richard Dorch was um, indicted. Uh, and charged with uh, a felony. He served two and a half years in prison. Uh, thankfully, he recovered his integrity. Uh, later on, wrote a book called Integrity, How I Lost It and My Path Back. Uh, at the same time, he told me this story with tears. He said, the toughest thing I think I've ever done is to take a walk with my grown son. I forget the city they were living in, but the son was living in the same city as, as Richard and his wife. And uh, Richard Dorch, having gotten out of prison, taking this walk with his grown son, and he asked him, he said, son, do, do you like living here? Yeah, Dad, I, I, I want to establish our family here and stay here and start a business here. And Richard said to his son, he said, that's great, but I'm going to give you a word of counsel. If you do that, I think it's in your best interest if you change your name. What a grief uh, to have to say that to your own son. That's a story of integrity loss. And again, praise the name of Jesus. He recovered it and uh, came clean before the Lord, led a lot of men to the Lord uh, during his time of imprisonment. But then there's the other man, the great reformer, Martin Luther, uh, brought before an inquisition at the diet, uh, uh, which, which was a, a, an official convening of the Holy Roman Empire, along with the established church. So Luther had both the church and government, uh, against him. You can imagine the intimidation that was there in the city of, of Worms. And he was asked to recant because he had come back simply to the simplicity of the gospel by the readings in particular of Galatians and Romans. And Luther's response as is recorded by many. Luther said something at least to this effect, unless you prove to me by the scripture and plain reason that I am wrong, I cannot recant. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. As a result of this, Pope Leo called him both a criminal and a notorious heretic. 
Now, uh, I believe God's doing wonderful things in our country, and I'm personally praying for and am high am, and I am in high anticipation of a fresh move of the Spirit of God across our nation. A, a, a fresh Jesus movement. It's gonna, not going to look like the last one, but it, it uh, will be just as wonderful, just as precious, and I'm, I'm very confident in my spirit that I'm going to do that. However, if that does not come, I think each of us looks to a future not unlike Martin Luther's, being called the very thing that we would not be, a notorious heretic. I think there is an unholy alliance many times between government and established religion against the gospel. We have seen this throughout history, and we need to uh, learn from history and prepare for it. Luther, on his way away from that pronouncement of him as a heretic, uh, now his life was in danger, and he received a friendly kidnapping and was taken, as you might recall, to Wartburg Castle, where he was held in hiding for several years. It was during that time, however, that Luther produced probably uh, his greatest work of fruitfulness, no question, his greatest work of fruitfulness in his life. We know him as the great reformer, but do we also know him as the one who translated from the original Greek the New Testament into modern German. What a tremendous gift that he gave to the nation, uh, bringing them into the light of the Reformation. This was a man who did not lose his integrity, though he knew the cost was high and he was willing to pay that cost. I remember a few years ago, I uh, had just heard of, of a... Uh, uh, a widely known preacher. He had a national telecast at the time. Uh, he preached on one Sunday, divorced his wife early in the week, married his, what they then called secretaries, uh, a couple days later, and preached the next Sunday as if nothing had happened. I was driving along just kind of chafing at that before the Lord, and the Holy Spirit spoke so clearly to me, almost close to audible. He spoke to my spirit and said, you are not better than that man. And then he, he also said to me, you just married a wonderful woman. All of us are, are just one sin away from losing our integrity from losing all that we've built, all we've prayed for, all we've worked for, all we have preached. All of that can be smeared uh, with a single act that is reckless or unwise. Psalm 78, verse 72, and let me just encourage you, would you just write down these passages so that later before the Lord you can go back and meditate over these passages. The scripture says, David fed them, the children of Israel, his nation. David fed them according to the integrity of his heart. And he guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Integrity of heart, skillfulness of hands. There is a great, a, a, a gift mix in each of us that is unique to us. No one in the world has the same mix of natural ability, uh, dominant spiritual gifts, and then the circumstances of life that have made you the person that you are. It's a wonderful thing, but we guide the people not only with that grace of God gift mix, but with integrity of heart. The word integrity in the Hebrew speaks of being complete or whole. It's a whole life. It's the equivalent of what Jesus spoke of. In John chapter 10, verse 10, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Notice what the Apostle Paul said to his protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He said, till I come, give attention to reading, listen to this, to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. What was he saying to this young pastor? 
until I come back, give yourself to personal mental development with reading. Give yourself to your preaching, to exhortation. And give yourself to theology, to doctrine. I'm very excited today to hear Jeff Wickwire uh, this morning and what he's going to share with us along those lines. Paul went on. He said, don't neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy uh, with the laying on of the hands of the elders. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them so that your progress may be evident to all. And then again, take heed to yourself and take heed to your doctrine. I believe that's the word of the Lord for us today. Take heed to yourself. Take heed to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will both save yourself and those who hear you. Integrity is defined as adherence to moral or ethical principles. It's a state of being undiminished, a whole person. Uh, the, the word actually has almost the equivalent of prosperity. A truly prosperous person, you're prospering on the inside, as John talked about, even as your soul is prospering. That is an integrous person. And so today, for these few moments, let's talk about integrity in three specific areas. Integrity of motive, integrity of the message, and then integrity of the messenger. Integrity of motive, why am I doing what I'm doing? Integrity of the message, what am I preaching? <laughs> Reminds me of the preacher who got riled up one night and he was preaching away and he said, I'm not just preaching, I'm telling the truth. <laughs> so let, let's give... Uh, give attention to the message and then the integrity of the messenger, how am I living? First of all, the integrity of motive. Why am I doing this? David said in his penitent psalm, after he had sinned with Bathsheba in the 51st psalm, and after he had been confronted, of course, by the prophet Nathan and acknowledged his sin, and, and, and have you noticed that it seems that we're living in a culture now that it, it's very difficult for people just to own up to, uh, uh, to what they have done? Not David. David said, you're right, I'm the guy, I am the man. And in this 51st Psalm, he asked the Lord to cleanse him, to create a clean heart. And he said, Lord, you desire truth in the inner self, sometimes translated integrity, truth of heart. We're not lying to ourselves about what we're doing or who we are. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2, I, I, I'm going to, to read this passage because I think it's very important for us. It's not in the, the, uh, the PowerPoint, but notice this. Paul said, or, or Peter rather said, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by, uh, by compulsion, but willingly, not for, uh, these lights are a little tough, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but as being examples to the flock. I did look up that Greek word example. It means the, the force of impact that leaves a lasting impression. That your life is to be a force of impact that leaves a lasting impression. That's to be an example to the flock. And then to remember, and I think it's important for us to remember, the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, Billy Graham's favorite chorus was a little chorus that, very simple, we don't sing it anymore. It's just with eternity's values in view. Let me live every day for Jesus with eternity's values in view. Being an example to the flock. You desire truth in the inward part. 
Why do we do what we're doing? First of all, we do it for the people's sake. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. If you want assurance in your preaching, live an integrous life. You know what kind of people we were among you, Paul wrote. We're doing it for the people's sake. And we will give an account at the judgment seat of Christ to Jesus himself when the chief shepherd comes back. And by the way, I think there is a crown that is in some senses exclusively for uh, pastors. It's the crown of glory. Uh, Peter said, feed the flock of God, and when the chief shepherd comes back, if you've been faithful in that assignment, he then will give you a crown of glory which will not fade away. Why is it a crown of glory? Well, it's because a lot of times pastors get anything but glory uh, down here. They're the one who catches the flack. Uh, a lot of folks have a barbecued preacher for Sunday dinner. Uh, but there is a time coming when the Lord will reward. And we look to that wonderful time. We do it for the people's sake, but also for Jesus' sake. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. We don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Why are we doing what we're doing? We're doing it for the people's sake. But we're also doing it for Jesus. It's for him. It's for Jesus' sake. We're also doing it for Jesus' reputation, for his name's sake. 3 John 7 they went out in behalf of his name, for his name's sake, taking nothing from unbelievers. Now, let me just pause here. In most every church, there's the guy who has an agenda that treats your kids real nice, that gives them presents, that uh, uh, takes you with him on the 50-yard line for uh, the cool game and all of that, but he has an agenda, and he'll pull you aside and say, look, don't come down so hard on whatever. Brothers, we cannot be beholden to any man. We're, we're given an account to Jesus. And let's not uh, indenture ourselves to men in any way. Let's be independent voices for Christ that he alone has the preeminence. We do it for the people's sake. We do it for Jesus' sake. We do it for his name's sake. And we're doing this for the gospel's sake. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. Paul said, I've become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. I am, I am doing this, he said, for the gospel's sake. I am doing it for the advance of the gospel. Folks, even our testimony, and I, I'm a big believer in giving testimonies. This is a, a day of stories, and people respond to stories. And that's, that's wonderful. That's great. We need to do that, but let's not be confused. Your testimony is not the gospel. Your testimony testifies to the power of the gospel. The gospel is not about you. It's about what Jesus did for you. If your message does not include a bloody cross and an empty tomb, you are not preaching the gospel. That is the good news. I love what James Emery White wrote. He said, we must respond to God's call in such a way as to fulfill our place in the world and then... Fill it full with the aroma and the agenda of Christ. 
integrity of motive, for the people's sake, for Jesus' sake, for his name's sake, and for the gospel's sake. And then the integrity of our message, the message itself. What am I preaching? Paul wrote to Timothy again, his protege, chapter 1, verse 14 of 2 Timothy, protect through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure that has been entrusted to us. We have been entrusted with the gospel. God is not trying to deliver the church from scandals. Problem is, we're just involved in all the wrong scandals. The scandal we are to embrace is the scandal of the cross. We're known for all the wrong scandals, the scandals of, of uh, impropriety in, in one way or another, of sin uh, against our people by dishonoring the Lord and dishonoring our commitment as ministers of the gospel and just as followers of Jesus. Those are the wrong scandals. But there is a scandal which we should embrace and stand with pride and, and gratitude. And it's the scandal that is caused by the preaching of the cross. Romans chapter 9, verse 33. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, a petron scandalou in the Greek, a rock of scandal. And whoever believes in him shall not be put to shame. Bloody cross and empty tomb, that is the gospel. What Christ has done in taking our sins upon himself. We are representing Jesus. Paul said, we're ambassadors for Christ. We represent him. I remember on a plane years ago, I was sitting next to a man and just asked the Lord, though I was tired, I wanted to kind of just doze off, and I said, Lord, I am available. And I began to just converse with the guy sitting next to me, and I asked him what he did, and he said, I, I sell real estate. And looked at me, he said, what do you do? Well, I kind of straightened my collar, and I said, uh, I'm an ambassador. He looked at me with big eyes. He said, you are? I said, yes, I really am. I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And we had a wonderful conversation about the gospel. I was able to plant the gospel. And though he did not pray to receive Christ, he assured me that he was going to read the gospel of John and look further at what I shared. It's a scandal for much of the world. And have you noticed, I, I didn't think in the United States I'd live to see the day when the gospel is under as much attack as it is today. That is likely to increase a fresh move of the Spirit across the nation. A second Jesus movement will once again retard that and push it back for a season. But judgment is coming. Scripture is clear about that. There, there's no denying. Judgment will come. And it will come to those who do not obey God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We represent him. That's why Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, continue in the faith. This horrendous word deconstruction that uh, is occurring over and over again uh, among us. We need to be kind, we need to be tender, and we need to be straight with people. They're on a very, very dangerous path. We are not to deconstruct. We are to construct. We're working on a building, as the old spiritual says. Let's continue to build for the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So watch our motives. Watch the message. Protect that message, the purity of the gospel. But then let's talk for a bit here about the integrity of the messenger. How am I living and who am I living for? At the beginning of the, the 21st century, I was asked by Charisma Magazine, uh, what's going to be different about ministry in the 21st century? 
And I remember responding at the time, trust will be harder to gain and it will be easier to lose. I believe that has borne out over these last 22 years. When I started out in ministry, which was in 1966, preached my first sermon in 1966, and I've, I've just never stopped. Uh, it was assumed by culture, even by unbelievers, it was assumed that you could trust ministers. That was the, the general assumption in culture. Now, the general assumption in culture is that you cannot trust ministers. We're working, brothers, from a deficit that we must change by our attitude and by our demeanor and by our life. Billy Graham said this. <laughs> We're all quoting Billy Graham, and there's a reason for that. When wealth is gone, Graham said, or when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, everything is lost. I just pray, you know, today that the Spirit of God once again for all of us. Now, something I love about this group, I believe all of you are godly men and women. That's what I know you to be. But I also know the assaults of the enemy. I know the assaults of the culture around us. I know the pressure against us and against the gospel. And at the end of this message, in a couple of minutes, in a few minutes, uh, we're going to have an opportunity again to just ask the Lord to search us afresh and to come fully clean before the Lord. I'm going to give you a quote in a couple of minutes by a, a great young man of God who never lived to see his 30th birthday. He died when he was 20 years old. His name was uh, Robert Murray McShane. And he said, a, uh, a, a minister, a godly minister is, uh, he said, an awful weapon. Language kind of morphs. We would say awesome today. Godly minister is an awesome weapon in the hands of God. Wholeness. Wholeness of life. Uh, it, it, we get the word integrity from uh, the word integer. An integer is a whole number. It's, it's not a fraction number. It's a whole number. And uh, uh, in the same way, a person of integrity is a whole person. You see, uh, there's a, there is the public persona of who we are. But there's also the private person of who we really are. Now, if there is any even slight wedge of difference between the public perception and the private person into that slight wedge of difference, that's where the enemy comes in. And that's when he begins to wreak havoc in our lives. Notice what Warren Bennis said. I don't know whether Bennis is a believer or not, but he, uh, he's one of the top writers on the subject of leadership. And a couple of decades ago, Bennis wrote this. He said, with respect to the spastic changes taking place in the world today, the trust factor will reign as the most pivotal factor of a leader's success. The trust factor. Do people trust you? I remember John Maxwell giving an illustration that is so applic applicable for all of us. He said, when is it time for a pastor to leave his church? And he said, every pastor goes into a new assignment, into a new church with what he called a pocket full of change, pocket full of coins. He said, each of those coins is called trust. And in just the interplay and interaction of life every day, we're exchanging those coins. I'll get back to you on that. I'll text you on that. I'll send you an email. Uh, uh, let me look that up and I'll call you. All of those, you're exchanging trust. 
when is it time for a pastor to leave a church? Maxwell said, when we're out of change. May our pockets always be full. And may we always have that, that trust that uh, comes from a life of integrity. God doesn't want to deliver us from scandal, as I said, but to be in the right scandals. We are known, or tra tragically, not we, but collectively, the church is known for uh, the big three, the abuse of money, the abuse of sex, the abuse of power. For pastors many times, it is the abuse of power that causes the abuse of money and the abuse of sex. Uh, we need to, to take a thorough inventory by the Holy Spirit. I've had an accountability partner for 32 years. He also heads a mission organiz organiz organization uh, similar to the one that I serve, Global Advance. We meet almost monthly. We have met almost monthly for 32 years. Uh, we ask each other very piercing questions every time we meet. We hold each other's feet to the, to the fire. These are not questions that uh, we thought up. I heard it on a broadcast of Chuck Swindoll. Uh, we modified them a little bit, but not much. And so we ask these questions of one another, looking at each other in the eye. Since we last met, have you had a personal daily time with the Lord? Since we la last met, have you... Uh, been with a woman in an inappropriate way or what others might perceive to be inappropriate. Since we last met, have you been involved in any financial dealings that you wouldn't want reported on the front page of the Dallas Morning News? Uh, since we last met, would you describe your marriage as better or worse? And then we look at each other and ask the final question. Now, you just lied to me about anything. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to stand here and tell you that I'm the quality of man and the quality of follower of Jesus that doesn't need that kind of accountability. Uh, that's what I'd love to be able to tell you. But the fact of the matter is I'm very grateful for that level of accountability. Now, of course, that person that you find must be completely trustworthy, as uh, uh, my accountability partner is. But to every pastor here, what I, I would urge you to find a colleague in ministry that has no, not a board member, not an elder, deacon, nobody in your church, another pastor in another church, a friend, where you can hold each other's feet to the fire. Paul wrote, to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, you are our letter. You are our epistle, known and read by all men. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Another translation says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in our ministry. Notice what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Robert Murray McShane made this great statement. I think it's one you'll want to keep. He said, it is not great talent God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awesome weapon in the hand of God. A holy minister is an awesome weapon in the hand of God. And our dear brother Ed Cole I uh, made this wonderful statement. He said, nations are great, not by virtue of their wealth, but by the wealth of their virtue. The same way with pastors. Pastors are great, not by virtue of their wealth, but by the wealth of their virtue. Back to Martin Luther as we 
land this. Luther was attacked for preaching the truth. His accusers were an amalgamation of government and established religion. He was threatened and he was verbally abused, but God protected him and rearranged his schedule and gave him opportunity to do what he probably would not have gotten to otherwise. He was so busy in preaching and in the day-to-day -day responsibilities, he probably wouldn't have translated the scripture had God not protected him and really put him in isolation for, I think, almost a couple of years. But in that protected place, he produced his most fruitful and lasting contribution. Let us take lessons from those who have gone before us. Let us take lessons from Luther. If God protected Luther, he will protect you. I, as the days grow short before I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I got a lot of un, unfinished symphonies out there. I don't know about you. But I'm coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, do you want me to discard any of these? Which ones do you want me to finish? Grace me and anoint me to finish them. And then, Lord, you provide the platform for them. At the end of the Second World War in Paris, several GIs, uh, American servicemen, were still stationed in Paris after the war. There was a, a little boy there in Paris, who, one of the kids who was roaming the streets. Food was hard to find. His parents had been killed in the war. And one day, an American GI was just walking down the sidewalk, and he saw this little boy with his face up against, looking inside, a bakery. This little boy was obviously hungry. And the American GI walked inside, walked right past the boy, didn't say a word. But the little boy watched as the, uh, the person behind the counter filled up a pretty substantial stack full of rolls and bread and pastries. The American GI paid for it. He walked outside, and he gave that sack to the little boy. The little boy looked up at him and said, Mr., are you Jesus? <laughs> May we live in such a way that the coming generation can say, uh, uh, you may not be Jesus, but you represent him, don't you? Are you, are you Jesus? The, the prayer of David, Psalm 139, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxieties. Doesn't that sound contemporary? And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me. Lead me in the way everlasting. We're going to ask God to search our hearts for any wicked way. We're going to acknowledge and repent of anything that the Holy Spirit reveals to us. And as much as we can, because I believe the Holy Spirit's going to speak to some of us in the next few minutes, as the Holy Spirit uh, speaks to you about a ruptured relationship, that you need to take the initiative to endeavor to heal, whatever the response of the other party might be, we'll commit to do that as the Lord directs us. We're going to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us anew and afresh because he is the one who provides the grace and the strength to do uh, what needs doing and to live in a, in a Christ-honoring way. We're going to humble ourselves before the Lord. We're going to draw on his word and on his spirit. A holy minister is an awesome weapon in the hand of God. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you that you are an ever-present help in time of need. 
you've invited us to come to you. And particularly those who are weary and work very hard. Come to me, you said. All of you who labor and work so hard, I'll give you rest. And Lord, we're just asking you to uh, do a deep work in us. We're praying the prayer of David this morning. Lord, search us. I know in me, Lord, you don't have to search very far. Lord, search our minds, search our hearts, search our motives. Search for any compromise in the message. But particularly, Lord, search for any compromise in we, your messengers. And Father, today we just make a fresh commitment. Everything for you, Lord Jesus. Everything on the altar. We turn from every wicked way. And we thank you, Lord, for the promise of your word that if we agree with you about any sin in our life, if we agree with you that that has no place in us as followers of Jesus, if we confess our sins, Lord, you are faithful. Thank you for that. You are righteous. You're just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, needy as we are, wounded in ministry as we sometimes can be, errant and willfully walking even momentarily in a way that's not pleasing to you, we bring all of that before you today, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that your grace is greater than all of our sin. And, Lord, we place it all under the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the mighty promise of your word. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We receive that today, Lord. Lord, you've given us a commission to fulfill. We have a generation to reach with the gospel. And Father, give us the grace to do it by your power and by your spirit. Let's just stay in the presence of the Lord. I want to give you a biblical benediction, and then we're going to, uh, to cap this off. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. There's a song, even since I've been up here, that's been going through my spirit. I don't think I've ever led <laughs> uh, as a worship leader, and particularly in a pastor's conference, but I'm going to be the first to be vulnerable here. Would you just lead me, or, or lead, uh, sing with me as, as we sing this, make it the prayer of our hearts. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in his presence day. Let's just stand and sing it. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I Let's sing it again, that chorus. I surrender. 